Dr. John Gavlowski. He's our, woo, tried and true, our, our, our Gavlowski. He's an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture based out of Carmen. He conducts monitoring programs for some of the more common insect pests of crops and provides information on insects, both beneficial and potential pests, to farmers, agronomists, and those working in agriculture. He does numerous presentations and information updates for agronomists and for farmers, and co-produces a weekly Manitoba crop pest report during the spring and summer. He's worked since Manitoba Agriculture since 1997. He has a bachelor's degree in environmental biology and an MSc in entomology from the University of Guelph and completed his PhD in the Department of Entomology at the University of Manitoba. Apart from entomology, John also enjoys cycling and observing almost any type of wildlife. So we gave him this title from an orthopteran overload to sinister sapsuckers, main insect concerns in crops in Manitoba in 2022, and he agreed to do a talk on it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That was his title. We couldn't get him to budge, so that's the title. <laughs> and uh, here we go. Thanks, John. Okay, we'll see how many of you know what orthoptera are to start with. So yes, um, so basically what I wanna do is a bit of a recap of what happened. Um, some of the insects will try to forecast what we want to, or what we expect for the next season. Um, so I've picked out eight insects that we're going to cover. These are what I consider the top eight for this year. Uh, and then, again, what we're going to forecast. I've also thrown in, I guess, a ninth, what I consider our biggest entomological surprise of the year. There's always one that comes along that um, uh, you just don't foresee. I've also got two skill testing questions once again for this meeting. And we've got some fantastic prizes. They wouldn't allow me to do the Alaskan cruise again because of COVID, but um, we do have some pests and predators field guides. Um, so this book here, it's got, um, well, nice photos of both the pests and uh, your predators. And we also have um, Field Heroes t-shirts. Now the way I'm gonna work my questions, I've got two of them. The first one's gonna be for the virtual audience only. Question two, for the fittest few that uh, we weeded out for our group here in person. Um, so question two is going to be in audience only. So virtual and then audience. So here's my uh, top insect concerns from 2022. Um, you'll notice I've got things categorized here. Flea beetles and grasshoppers are at the top. Um, I gave this presentation last year as well, and those were the exact same two I had at the top last year, and I think back in 2020 it was the same thing, so there's a trend here. Um, the ones in the middle have changed a little bit. We've got three aphid species in there from this year, and I've thrown in a few others that were more uh, localized uh, problems, so your armyworms, ligus, and cutworms. Our biggest surprise of the year was crickets in field crops. So I wanna address those as well and talk about what happened and why I think it might have happened the way it did. So we'll do that as well. And uh, as many of you know, I always throw in at least a couple of the, the, the good bugs that we were seeing a lot of in the field. So we've got um, a two predator and parasitoid profiles that we'll cover as well, including a really cool parasitoid video. So we will get to that. So now this slide here, um, some of you might be saying, I've seen this before, and yeah, you pretty much have. Again, the same slide pretty much that I've used the last two years here. Um, flea beetles, once again, were our top insect, and once again, I mean, in spite of us having a neonic treated or even enhanced seed treatments on pretty much all the seed, there was massive foliar spraying this year. And it was the same general situation as the previous few years. People seeded, and then we got conditions that just kept the plants in that seedling stage for way too long. Uh, seed treatments ran out, and people were doing foliar sprays, sometimes multiple foliar sprays. Um, I had people saying they were spraying, foliar spraying as many as four or five times, which is a lot. So um, I'm gonna talk a bit um, about maybe how to try to reduce that number in just a few slides. But that was what was happening. Um, there was some reseeding in some areas as well. So again, massive problem. But again, part of it is with, with flea beetles, usually when people are doing multiple foliar sprays, it's because those seedlings are just being stressed to the point where um, they just can't get to that more resistant stage quickly enough. 
So the, the challenge with flea beetles is always to get that plant to the three to four leaf stage within about three to four weeks after seeding date. If you can do that, if, if you can get it to three to four leaf stage in three weeks, you probably should be able to get by with the seed treatment alone, but uh, all you need is a few stresses on the plant that prevent that from happening, and uh, then you're running into problems. So, um, again, we had uh, uh, stresses that, get, that held the plants back last year, a lot of foliar spraying. Um, so one of the questions people have been asking me this winter is, what can I do to reduce the, the foliar sprays that I'm doing? A few um, guidelines to, to maybe help somewhat. And, and again, right now there's no silver bullets. Uh, we, we can't suggest that we've got anything that's going to either prevent you having to do the foliar sprays or get it down to just one. We don't have a product with a residual that can allow us to do that. Uh, one thing I do recommend is use the existing thresholds we've got, but, the th but keep in mind our thresholds are guidelines. Right now we're, we're still suggesting 25% as your economic threshold. Uh, we've got a study going on across the prairies right now in all three provinces where that threshold is being reevaluated. Um, and based on the preliminary results, 25% is still what we're recommending. Um, so go with that. But again, that's a guideline. Uh, look at things like how much stem feeding is occurring, what's the weather forecast, uh, projected to be like the next uh, few days. Um, what's the flea beetle population like to take that in consideration? Again, this is a guideline. There might be times when spraying at less than 25% is the right decision based on how the flea beetles are feeding. Thresholds are guidelines and um, you have to use a lot of other science as well to try to uh, sometimes make the best decisions. The other thing you can look at is how are the flea beetles advancing into the field? Now if we get a cooler spring, they're not flying as far and sometimes you'll notice that they're coming out of their overwintering sites and they're very gradually moving in and there, there are times when you can get away with just doing an edge spray for flea beetles. So, but that, that takes scouting. Uh, this is where a good agronomist can save a farmer a lot of money. Um, if you notice that the population and the damage is really occurring along the field edge. Sometimes you can get away with an edge spray. But again, you have to scout to see if that's practical or not. And again, consider the, the, the weather conditions that are um, currently happening and forecasted. Um, as we get into um, warmer, drier, um, calm weather, the flea beetles will feed more aggressively. They don't like to feed under humid conditions. We still don't know exactly why that is. Uh, back when I was doing lab studies on flea beetles, we had flea beetles in cages in the lab. On the humid days, I wanted them to feed. Uh, I, I needed flea beetle feeding to do my experiments. On humid days, they just weren't feeding. I would have to wait for a drier day, then they would start feeding. Same temperature, everything else was the same, but the humid days, they just weren't feeding. So uh, they like the drier weather, they like the warmer weather, and they like it calm. If it's too windy, they probably won't feed as much as well. So uh, you can factor those things in. Uh, again, what they're forecasting, that will tell you how much time you've got before you need to consider getting that spray on. And also the performance of your spray. Um, I, I, I try to stress this, that um, a hot, calm day uh, for the flea beetles, they're more active. But if it's too hot, your sprays aren't, it depends on what you're using, but some of the sprays won't work as well. Especially when we get into the pyrethroid group, uh, some of those sprays just don't perform as well once you get into the high 20s. So uh, just be careful of that as well. And as far as forecasting flea beetles for the next season, I'll keep this short, expect them. Um, yeah, we, we've been caught at a, a, a chronically high level for years. Um, they seem to overwinter well under our prairie conditions, and we don't have the natural enemies that seem to be able to knock a population out the way we do with some other insects. So expect them. Put that as one of your, um, I guess, top few to watch for going into next year. Okay, number two on my list was grasshoppers. And this slide isn't too much different from last year, but I did highlight one thing here. Our dominant species by far last year was two-striped 
The previous year we had more of the clear winged grasshoppers mixed in. Um, and you might recall clear winged is your grass specialist. It likes grassy plants. It won't feed on things like canola and soybeans and sunflowers. Two striped is a generalist. It feeds, if it's hungry enough, it'll feed on just about anything. Uh, that seemed to be our, our dominant species in almost all regions last year. So you're dealing with a generalist that it's also our biggest of our pest species of grasshoppers. It's one of our bigger species of grasshoppers, period. So big appetite, generalist feeder, and uh, we had big numbers in some areas. Now some fields, people were able to get away with doing edge sprays. And again, this is where a good agronomist can really save a farmer a lot of money. Um, if you determine that uh, the population is moving in from a certain, say, ditch or field edge, uh, very heavily concentrated, uh, you can target those grasshoppers instead of having to do a whole field. And there was some of that, but there was also some whole field spraying that had to be done. Uh, but we did have reports of grasshopper issues from all our agricultural regions, certainly not every field, but within every region there were issues. So uh, it was quite a widespread thing once again, and uh, a, a positive note regarding our grasshopper situation though, um, I went out to some fields last year that had high levels of what we call summit disease. Um, in the past, I've probably used the scientific name, the entomophagia grilli, that's the big scientific name, but uh, summit disease is the other name for this. And what it is, is uh, the grasshoppers, when they get infected, Behaviorally, they change and they, uh, they climb to the top of the plant, they cling on tightly, and they end up dying clinging to the top of the plant very tightly. And the, the picture that'll be on your right, all those little brown specks on the plant, that's all dead grasshoppers. It was that dense, and uh, at least the one field that I went up to, this was taken near McGregor, um, this particular field. But uh, yeah, some of the fields, it, it was thick, thicker than I've ever seen before. So that's a positive side. There was some disease in the population this year. And I think what happened, we got a lot of damp, humid weather early on. That's when the fungus gets going. You notice it later in the season. Uh, it doesn't become apparent all the dead grasshoppers on the plants until usually August or September. But that pathogen's been in their body for weeks, probably by the time you see them dead up there. Um, and that damp, humid weather we got early on could have got this, um, the spores built up. They, th these spores overwinter, by the way, on the soil. And when you get that damp weather uh, early in the season, sometimes those spores, uh, they're, they're picked up and spread and more viable in that uh, damper weather. So uh, damp, humid conditions do help this uh, fungal pathogen proliferate a little bit. Uh, the other thing just worth noting is there's actually three different what we call pathotypes of this fungal pathogen. Uh, one is specific to only two-striped grasshopper, won't affect the other uh, species that we've got. The other is specific to clear wing grasshopper, and one will affect both of them. Uh, and it's, it's often hard to tell uh, for sure what pathotype you've got, but at least you can narrow it down to one of about two based on the species you're seeing. And it was two-striped grasshopper that we were seeing dead clinging when we were out there this year. So uh, good to see some uh, natural enemies in action. And also regarding natural enemies, there was a lot of these uh, bee-like flies in some of the fields. These are called bee flies, oddly enough. Um, so they look, they look like bumblebees, but they're, they're flies. And uh, there's a species called the grasshopper bee fly that we were seeing a lot of. The larvae of that species eat nothing but grasshopper eggs. They're grasshopper egg specialists. We were seeing a lot of them last year. That's good. Their populations build, and we've been seeing them building over the last few years. In fact, they were so numerous that uh, this year one of our summer students actually caught one by hand and brought it to me. They were flying around just outside our building at work. And, um, but yeah, we've seen more of them. Uh, blister beetles, there's a group of blister beetles. So here's a black one here. But there's also a gray species in the same genus. It's called Epicotta, the genus. And, uh, the black and gray ones, the epicotta uh, blister beetles, their larvae, again, are uh, grasshopper egg specialists. That's all they eat. So when you're seeing a lot of these in your soybeans and alfalfa and other crops, they do have a good side to them. The larvae are grasshopper egg specialists, so that's good. And field crickets, um, we, we had a lot of field crickets, and I'll talk a bit more about them later. But 
to give a positive spin to field crickets, uh, one of the things they will eat is grasshopper eggs. They're, they're omnivores, they eat a lot of things, but if they come across a batch of grasshopper eggs, that's great protein and they will definitely feed on it. So, um, what to expect for next year. Uh, we did do a survey. The map is, is my data is currently being mapped, so I don't have the map to show you. Um, levels were up uh, this year in the survey um, compared to the previous couple years even. So going into next year, uh, just like flea beetles, uh, be careful with the grasshoppers, be out there scouting early again, monitor those, especially the roadsides. Any place that had a lot of lush green vegetation late last year, that's likely where there's going to be more eggs. So in some fields, that'll be the roadside, the ditches. Monitor those areas uh, starting in about early June. It's a good time to start. That's usually when egg hatch is starting. And uh, try to be on top of where those big populations are early. Spraying for juveniles earlier is much more effective than trying to go after adults later in the season. Okay, so this brings us to our first question. And this is for our virtual audience. So our question is, I've got two species of aphids here. And we've got a, an aphid here, green with black cornicles or tailpipes and some black stripes on the legs. Question is, what species of aphid is this? Do we have an answer yet? No, nobody's, t nobody's saying that. Okay, it. hmm. They fell asleep. There's only 273 of them there. Okay, I'll give you, oh boy, I'm, this is a hard one to give clues on. Um, this one does like to feed up in the grains. The word grain is in the name, um, <laughs> if that helps. Oh, we got it. Okay. We got well, it. You make the clues easy enough, and okay. Thanks, Randy, Randy Wenzel. Okay, awesome, awesome. Great job, Randy. So yeah, this, uh, this is English grain aphid, and the other one on my screen is the oat bird cherry aphid. It is good to know the difference, because one of these two is a better disease vector than the other. Um, so we've talked a lot about diseases earlier. The oat bird cherry aphid is our better disease vector, the English grain aphid. I won't say it, it can't, but it's a much weaker disease vector. And you can tell these two apart easy if you have a little bit of a micro, uh, magnifying glass. Again, this one's fairly big and it's got uh, these black cornicles at the end. Uh, the oat bird cherry aphid is a lot smaller, more of a dark green, and if you look really carefully, there's like a little brown saddle at the back of the abdomen, but you pretty much do need a magnifier to see that, uh, unless you really know what you're looking for. Um, but you can tell these two apart. If you get the oat bird cherry coming in early, you do want to be on top of that, and you have to be careful uh, of by the yellow dwarf as well, if that's the case. Uh, this year, they did come in, they came in in June, we had both species, we did have some barley yellow dwarf, and we did have, um, in, at least in some areas, people were spraying. Most of the spraying for the aphids happened in about um, uh, late July through about mid-August. That seemed to be the window when we had a lot of spraying for the aphids. Now, in a lot of years, when we get into late July, um, people wouldn't be worrying about aphids and cereals, because once cereals get to that soft dose stage, then the aphids aren't going to be doing any more economic damage. The crop is already, the, the grains have filled, they're starting to dry down. We, after soft dough, we tell you don't worry about the aphids and the cereals. And often by late July, you don't need to worry about them. This year, because of the uh, wet weather early on, all the late seeding, we had people still spraying for aphids in mid-August, so in the cereals. So uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of uh, having all the late seeding that we did this year. Now, the other th thing I'll just uh, mention is a few people commented on just the volume of natural enemies they were seeing in some of these fields. And some people actually had t a tough time deciding whether they wanted to spray or not because we've got a lot of aphids, but we've also got a lot of good guys in the field, so what do we do? And unfortunately, we still don't have a selective insecticide for aphids in Cereals, for any of you company reps out there, we really, really need a selective insecticide for aphids in cereals. It would be nice to be able to, yeah, it'd be nice, be nice to be able to take out the aphids and not be killing off all the beneficials. We just don't have that in our cereal crops. So there's a job for some of you uh, company reps there. Um, one of the natural enemies that people were seeing a lot of, though, was hoverflies. And once again, I was getting a lot of questions, people saying, 
what are these slug-like things all over? Um, well, often they were on the heads of the, the wheat. And people were saying, what are all these slug-like things? Do I need to worry about them? These are hoverfly larvae. And uh, it can be confusing because, again, they look kind of slug-like. They can be different colors. Um, some stats here for you. We've got almost 600 species of hoverflies in Canada. So very broad, diverse group. Uh, the, and as larvae, they're almost all predaceous, but they can be different colors. They can be uh, green like this one here. They can be a brownie color. So these two are feeding on soybean aphids. They can be almost a pinkish color. They can be quite pale, but uh, they're predators. They're eating pretty much nothing but aphids. Um, one of the things that aphids do um, when they're on the plant, they produce something called honeydew. They're always secreting this honeydew out of their back end. And that gets on the plants. Honeydew has a smell to it. So we don't really smell it too much, but hoverflies, are, they've got a good sniffer on their antenna. And they can smell this honeydew. And so they, where there's a lot of aphids, there's a lot of honeydew. So they go to where there's these aphid colonies, and they're laying their eggs right in the aphid colonies. So these guys don't even have to move to find their food. They're blind, legless, slug-like things, but they don't have to, they just probe around with their mouth parts, find an aphid, hold it up, suck the juice out, plop it down, grab another. Uh, that's the way they, they work, so. Um, and when they turn into a pupa, it almost looks, it's got a round end and a pointy end, so. Um, almost teardrop shaped, and you'll see them right up on the top of the plants as well, where the aphids were. Uh, so if you find these teardrop shaped things in the heads, hoverfly pupa, and these are the adults. They look like, um, they're, they're very, very uh, good bee and wasp mimics. They look like a bee, they somewhat act like a bee, but they will hover. Bees and wasps don't hover so much, these things do hence hoverflies. So those are good guys, you want them around. Um, and just to mention, if you're interested, there is an app called Serial Aphid Manager, um, produced by AAFC in Saskatoon. With, a, with this app, you do need to monitor five plants in an area, go to another area, five plants, and unfortunately you only get a recommendation after you've done all your 25 plants. You can't take shortcuts with the app. I know with the other aphid app, people like to use the, um, um, the one for soybeans. You can take shortcuts with that one. This one, you really can't. So some people might find it a bit um, onerous. But uh, on the positive side, you can get the app giving you recommendations on whether spraying is economic or not. And you're factoring in the natural enemies. You're actually counting lady beetles, lacewings, hoverflies, damselbugs, pirate bugs, things like that. So you can factor that in. Okay, one of our other aphids uh, that we dealt with last year was aphids in field peas. And uh, so they got to quite high economic levels and there was actually quite widespread spraying for them in some areas, uh, mainly the western part of the province, central region as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of people getting economic levels. Uh, for the most, there, there are some selective insecticides, uh, but the couple that were registered last year were more horticulture products, so they were more hort priced. There is a newer product that will be available this coming year uh, called Carbine. It is selective and it is going to be more field crop uh, focused. So uh, it won't be a, a strictly a hort product. So uh, you will have a selective option for uh, aphids in field peas for next year. Now, just like with um, the wheat, we did have some natural enemies in the field peas. And one that people were noticing a fair amount of was aphid mummies. And for some people, it was a little confusing because they, they look like another type of aphid. But Sometimes if you look carefully, you might even see the little hole in the back end where the wasp popped out of the aphid. Uh, what's happening is, I'll just go to my next slide. So here's an example of one of the wasps that produces these uh, aphid mummies. There's a big group called aphidias. We've got quite a few species here. And with aphidias, the way they work is they're moving around on the plants and they're, they're tapping around with their antenna trying to locate an aphid. And once they do locate the aphid, they take their abdomen and they whip it around really quickly and they insert an egg into the aphid. 
uh, when that egg hatches, the larva of the wasp lives inside the aphid. The aphid dies fairly quickly and becomes a home for the wasp larva. And then when the wasp pupates, it exits from the, the home, leaving that little hole in the back. And I do have a video to show this, if I can get this to work here. Oops, I'm not, let's go back here. I might need some tech help on this because there's a little, so I need to go back to the previous one. Okay, and there should be something right here that we have to, there we go. Does it have sound? It does have sound. And so what, what I want you to watch for is every time the wasp is tapping, it's flipping its abdomen forward. See if you can see that happening to lay an egg into the aphids. Here we go. The green peach aphids had taken over the crop, but their reign was ending. Enter Ophidius Irvi, a parasitoid capable of ravaging their populations. Our hero makes quick work of the aphids in record speed, turning these pesky yield suckers into a living host, growing an army of crop defenders to fight another day. So I, I don't know uh, if you're able to see it or not, but uh, it happens very quickly. And uh, one wasp like that can easily parasitize uh, m many aphids in a colony within half a minute or so. Uh, it doesn't take them long. They tap around, they find, they it's, it happens very quickly. Uh, this video was produced by our Field Heroes group. There's a group of us entomologists, we call ourselves the Field Heroes group. And, uh, we're, we're just a bunch of entomologists who like producing extension material on beneficial insects, and uh, so we have fun doing uh, fact sheets and guides and videos of the natural enemies. Um, so another uh, aphid that was a concern last year was our soybean aphid. This one caught us by surprise. We hadn't had an aphid problem since 2017. And one of the things that I encourage agronomists to do when they're out scouting in early in the season is to keep an eye for soybean aphids in uh, soybeans. I almost make a contest out of it to see who can find the first soybean aphids for the season. And I think Jason was the first to uh, uh, email me this year saying that he found soybean aphids. Um, and it was J uh, July 5th when we found the first ones. Usually when we have a soybean aphid problem, they're arriving in early July. It's usually July when they arrive. We've, we have had years when it's been as late as August when they've arrived, because they're, they're not overwintering here or overwintering well here. They're moving in from the south. And if they don't arrive until late July or August, in a normal growing season, less risk of there being an issue. When they arrive in early July, we have to watch and be careful. If they arrive in big numbers in early July, then we need to really start watching things. And uh, this year wasn't nearly as bad as 2017, but we did have economic um, problems. There was spraying going on. Uh, we do have a selective insecticide for aphids in soybeans. Um, some people did get to use it, but a lot of people said they just couldn't get it. It just wasn't in large enough supply. So, um, uh, yeah, just a heads up to some of the chemical company reps again. Uh, uh, if we are, uh, keep, keep um, tuned, I guess, and if we see an aphid situation developing, uh, we wanna get some of these selective insecticides in because there was the, the demand for them. I had agronomists phoning me saying, I want this product, it's selective. We, we've got lots of lady beetle larvae in the field, we've got lots of um, hoverflies, lots of lace wings. We'd rather let them live and kill the aphids, but they couldn't get the product, so they were spraying broad spectrum stuff instead. So uh, it'd be good to get in some more of that select, more selective uh, material. And uh, oh, here's our second question, and this is for the in-person audience. I heard an answer all here already. Uh, I won't accept lady beetle larva. I want more specific than that. This is a lady beetle larva. I want to know the species. Four, four dotted. 
It, no, it's not four dotted. There is no four dotted lady beetle. So, it's got nothing with dots or spots. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll give clues. There is a country in the name. Oh, sorry, a continent in the name. Oh boy, who got that one first? That's going to be a tricky one to pull away. Oh, in fact, there's more words than that. Um, yeah, there's something that refers to its morphology as well. It's coloring. No, it's not a color, but... Oh, come on. I don't know how I can... Uh... There's, there's diff these. Okay, so the adults can be one of several colors. There, there's multi colors of the species. Okay, who said multicolored Asian lady beetle? I did hear it. Okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Um, at the end of the, yeah, we can. The, yeah, um, if if you prefer, if you already have one or you prefer a T-shirt, we can uh, get you a shirt. If not, congratulations, you get one of our field heroes, field guides. So yes, this is the multicolored Asian lady beetle. It's our newer. One of our newer lady beetles. This is the one that um, is good at getting into your homes in the winter as well. But voracious um, appetites for uh, aphids. So we had lots of them last year. We also had lots of hoverfly larvae in the field as well. So um, some of the fields, the natural enemies did seem to keep things below economic levels. Other fields, things got away on them. And I, I had the other extreme too where agronomists were telling me um, we're just not seeing the natural enemies in our field. People were worried that maybe the overuse of insecticides earlier in the season may have knocked down the natural enemies to the point where they just couldn't do the job for the aphids and things, and that's possible. So, um, yeah, just something we have to be careful with. So, yeah, there's our multicolored Asian lady beetle. That's the correct answer. And I, I, just, I didn't have this one in my list, but I, I can't leave the aphids topic with at least showing a few pictures. We did have some pretty high uh, aphid populations in the sunflowers quite late. Um, there is a species called the sunflower aphid, and we don't often get huge levels. We do see it, but it's just one in maybe 10, 15 year phenomenon where we get these really big populations of it. Often there is an edge effect, but there's exceptions to that. Um, I do know of a few fields that got edge sprayed, and I do know of some fields where the whole field was sprayed for sunflower aphids. That's not a common thing. Again, it's a, um, more of a sporadic occurrence. Uh, but there were certainly some big numbers, and we did see a lot of natural enemies there too. Uh, this uh, lady beetle here is probably feeling like me walking into an all-you-can-eat buffet, thinking this is going to be real good. Um, so yeah, a lot of food for some of the natural enemies. Um, and again, this, this happened quite late in the season. Uh, my guideline regarding aphids and sunflowers, we don't have an economic threshold. It's not considered a major enough pest that it's really got the research. Um, nobody's done work developing a threshold. We don't have that. Um, if you can see visible evidence of wilting, yellowing, then uh, definitely spraying is likely going to be economical. But sunflowers have a lot of leaf material. These build up late. Uh, you do need pretty big numbers to uh, have things economical, but we don't have a numerical threshold. Uh, even if we did, I don't know that you'd want to sit there and try to count. You'd, you'd just be, just like soybean aphids, you'd be guesstimating levels. Okay, so on to uh, a few of our uh, more localized populations from last year. Um, army worms, so this is not birth of army worm, this is army worm, or some people call it cereal army worm, or true army worm. It's the one that likes to feed more on um, cereal crops, forage grasses. It will feed on broadleaf crops, but not to any great degree. When it's a pest, it's usually in the cereals and forage grasses. And uh, we had, they, they don't overwinter here at all. Um, in fact, uh, they overwinter in the southern U.S. And they actually are an insect that has a purposeful migration, just like monarch butterflies. Um, some insects just get blown in on the winds, like diamondback moths and some of our aphids. But armyworms actually migrate. They will actually purposely migrate north. And some years they seem to stick to the east of us and they'll move in and my colleagues in southern Ontario will be complaining about them and we'll have nothing. 
But every now and then, we do get a big population migrate in. Uh, this year, it was more the eastern part of the province, into the central region a bit that seemed to get the bulk of them. And uh, we did have some spraying more, and again, in the eastern part of the province. Um, and there, they are an insect that we can monitor for that migration. So we put up these traps. So there's a type of trap, we call it a multifer one trap. It's almost like our bucket traps for the Bertha armyworm. And we can put a little lure in here and uh, monitor for the adult stage, which migrates in. And so these traps were up. This was a much smaller scale monitoring program than we do for diamondback moth and Bertha armyworm. So we just had 11 traps up. Um, but our highest counts were in the east and central region predominantly. Uh, traps further west were generally quite low. So the traps did do a, a decent job this past year telling us where we want to be careful. Now with the traps, because you have a higher number in a trap does not mean you're gonna have a lot in the field. It means scout. Scout, look for the larva and see if uh, you do have an issue. And this is a scouting tip for armyworms. If you have any lodged areas in the field, you're much more likely to have higher numbers in those lodged areas. So um, scout those a bit more intensively. And any uh, denser stands of grassy plants. So if you've got a, an area that was maybe double seeded around the edges or something, those denser areas, you usually do find more of them there. So check lodged areas, denser grassy areas. Uh, that's really what they prefer the most for egg laying. So, so um, yeah. Ligus bugs, um, they were an issue in a few regions. They were a late issue this year. P earlier in the season, we weren't really seeing a lot. Um, but we did have some spraying in canola and people noting them in some higher numbers in flax and sunflowers and alfalfa seeds. So they do overwinter here. They're another one to keep an eye open for next year. And I'm not gonna spend much time on ligus because I did show this slide last year, but just to reiterate, we do have new earth thresholds for ligus in canola. So roughly 20 to 30 in 10 sweeps. Don't use those older tables. People were using them wrong. People were trying to extrapolate, because of the higher value of canola, people were trying to extrapolate from that table, and they were getting ridiculously low numbers, thinking that one in 10 sweeps was gonna damage their crop. One in 10 sweeps, if anything, probably improves your crop. Um, there's actually been research done to show that at low levels, ligus can actually increase yields. But they get to a point where, instead of stimulating new growth, they're actually Decreasing yield. So uh, don't take those old tables and yeah, extrapolate too much. Uh, use these newer thresholds. So I'll move on to our next one. Um, cutworms, um, not as bad, definitely not as bad as two years ago or even last year. The, the levels, uh, I've talked about this for a few years now where with cutworms, we get a bell curve where they build, they peak, they drop. We seem to be on that drop side of the curve. Um, a couple years ago, 2020 was a really bad year. 2021, a little less. This year, even a little less. We're still not out of the woods. We still had some issues with them, some spraying. But uh, again, things weren't as bad as uh, the previous year. But do keep an eye on them. Um, they're another one that early season could be an issue. And it was primarily dingy and redback still, but we had one more species this year that showed up as a bit of a surprise called black army cutworm. This is one that overwinters as partially grown larva. The larva are big early on. The larva tend to be gregarious. So uh, if you get them in a field, you'll have some plants that are just covered in them. But because they're gregarious, you often do have patches. So with them, you may not have to do full field spraying if they do seem to be at high levels. Often they're not even really pests, there's just a patch of them in the field and you can just let it go. But there was a couple of fields where there was at least part of the field sprayed last year up in the Northwest. So black army cutworm, overwinters as larva, big early on and gregarious. So here's my big surprise from this year, crickets. And I shouldn't be totally surprised because we've seen the levels climbing over the past few years. And with crickets, 
Uh, we've often, we, we really haven't considered them a crop pest here, but every now and then they will do things that just um, seem almost out of character and uh, do cause some damage on our crops. But we actually saw this in several crops this year, which was what was most surprising. Uh, wheat and barley, we saw them right up on the heads feeding on the grain. Canola, I've actually got a video I'll show you in a minute of them feeding right on canola pods. Uh, flax, uh, feeding on the bowls and strawberries, uh, getting up on the berries. And so once again, I might need help just getting the video going here. Um, but what, I, what I think happened this year with our crickets, um, three things. We had a high population for one. We had late seeded crops. So, uh, we have this. oh yeah, yeah. Get, so I'll, I'll just show you the feeding. So you can see this guy, this is mandibles right into the pod. So they weren't just feeding on moisture on the pods. They were actually feeding right into the pods. Uh, often when we're seeing crickets up on plants, we're, we're not quite sure, are they really feeding on the grain? Because sometimes they will climb up on the plants and just feed on the moisture, the dew drops and things. They like to do that. But no, they were feeding right on the canola pods, making big holes. And same with the flax bowls. They were feeding directly on it. So uh, something you've got to watch for. My speculations, and this is speculation, but we had high levels. We had late seeded crops. And so the crops were still mature and juicy enough when the crickets were um, abundant and thirsty late in the season. So possibly they were going for moisture uh, with these later crops, but really hard to know. But it, it, again, a uh, little bit abnormal behavior. I won't suggest that this will be a common problem, crickets on canola or cereals. Um, hopefully it's uh, uh, a one-off thing, but something just to keep an eye on. Uh, in many of the cases, it was an edge effect once again. They were coming in from the ditches and there was often very heavy edge effects. So a uh, couple resources. If you're needing more information, I've got fact sheets on pretty much all these insects on our website. So you can go there if you need more info. Um, our Field Heroes program, um, the guide I'm giving away, uh, actually it, it is free. So uh, if anybody does want to copy of this, yeah, sorry about that. You can get it for free. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, just go to this website and you can order your own copy of this. And, and there's, there's also a lot of fact sheets and other cool things there that you can look at. And just to summarize, um, weather didn't play into our favor last year. A lot of late seeded crops. Uh, really be careful with aphids. Uh, well, the aphids blow in, but be careful with the flea beetles and grasshoppers going into next year. Um, and uh, maybe ligus as well. Uh, flea beetles, grasshoppers, ligus, they all overwinter well here. So keep them on your must scout for list for next year. So maybe I'll end with that, and maybe we have a minute for a question, a yes. minute or two. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, do, we have, do we have maybe time for one question? Um, since we have more people online, Tammy, do we have any questions online? Nothing good. Nothing good. There's nothing good. Does anybody have a good question? I mean, <laughs> I mean how do you exterminate the lady beetles from your home? I'm still vacuum, vacuuming up four or five a day. I didn't put that in myself, but I might be interested in the answer. The Asian lady beetles at home. How am I? In, in your home, right? Yeah, how am I killing them? How, how do we kill them? Speak into the mic. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so Asian lady beetles in the home, how do you kill them? Um, yeah. ee, that's a tricky one. Uh, the easiest way is to try to vacuum them up and. Put them We're up. already doing that. Give so, us something funner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have a, an easy suggestion for you. One thing you could try to do is um, you can take a, a nylon or something um, stretchy and Put an elastic band to the tip of your vacuum tube and vacuum up. And then when you... Uh, so we're still vacuuming? You're yeah. still vacuuming, though. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there are um, these Asian lady beetle traps you can buy and you can put out. And they've got an abrasive material inside and supposedly a lure to draw them in. I can't vouch for how well they work, but... We'll talk later. You can, yeah, you can uh, give it a try anyway. Let me know how it works. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, John. Here is a token for, of our appreciation, and we're so glad you came out again. Thanks.